Father's Day 2012, I stood in this very spot and offered a sermon that consisted of three letters to father figures in my life. During the course of the sermon, I explained the three Chinese characters that make up my two last names. My Japanese last name, Tanaka, which means in the middle of a rice field, which is fitting for my Japanese-American ancestors who labored for over three generations on the sugarcane and pineapple plantations in the fields in the Hawaiian Islands. And my Korean last name, the Chinese character for my Korean last name, Pak, which as some of you remember means white. As I stood up here, I was a little nervous because what I was offering was deeply personal, very emotionally intense. And I stood up here and there was a child crying in the back of the sanctuary. And I normally am fine when children cry during worship, during a sermon, but this time I must admit I was particularly annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I was annoyed because in this situation, the child was so loud that I could barely even hear myself through these speakers in the sanctuary. But to be honest, in the same way that I was a little annoyed, I was also deeply grateful because the words I offered talked about how as a child, I cried a lot. And so I was so grateful that we here together could offer a space for this child to be safe, comfortable, and feel free to cry in this space. And to be perfectly honest, I was also grateful because on a personal level, what I was offering was so emotionally intense, I kind of needed that annoyance to distance me from the emotional intensity of what I was offering. The following is an excerpt of the first letter that I, I, I offered, a letter to my father, Gordon Kyoto Tanaka, who at the time had just celebrated his 70th birthday. Dear Dad, did you know that I didn't stop being a crybaby until I was a teenager? After the divorce, I tried to hide my crying from you. I knew my tears upset you. I can't imagine what it was like for mom and you to deal with a 10-year-old boy who was so sensitive that even the slightest word could trigger an endless flow of sobbing. I knew you were frustrated by my crying. I knew sometimes you were fed up, so fed up that you made me stand outside our house and you locked the front door behind me. But I didn't know why I was crying. Did you know? Did you know that I cried because I felt different? I sensed I didn't fit in. Did you know that I lived in constant fear because I didn't like sports and trucks and playing in the dirt, because I liked books and stickers and stuffed animals? Did you know that I cried because I felt ashamed I was not normal? I thought your discipline was cruel. I couldn't see that my crying interrupted and disrupted the entire household. I couldn't see that my crying threatened your authority as father. Today, I can see you were trying to discipline me in whatever way you knew how. You learned to be a man working with your arms and shoulders and back in the red clay dirt of the pineapple fields. Maybe by placing me outside the house, you were hoping I too would grow under the warmth of the sun and in the freedom of the air. Today, I can see that you were doing your best to shape me into a man. That's why after the divorce, you started calling me your main man. Today, 30 years later, I still don't like sports or trucks or playing in the dirt. I learned to be a man indoors. In a rehearsal room at college, as I directed a musical I wrote. In an executive boardroom, as I oversaw the global budget of a Wall Street firm. In a room in the intensive care unit, as I served as a hospital chaplain. 
Through each of these experiences, I learned not to fear who I am, bookish, awkward with my body, emotionally sensitive. And today, I am no longer afraid to cry. You were not always the perfect father, and I was often far from the perfect son. And yet I am grateful that even in the moments of imperfection, even in the times of misunderstanding, our relationship was always rooted in love. Your main man, Chad. After I offered that sermon, some of you came up to me and said, are you going to share that letter with your father? And I offered a very vague response like, well, it would make sense for me to do so now, wouldn't it? <laughs> Something very non-committal. Because to be honest, I wasn't sure if I wanted to share that information with my father. I wasn't sure if I wanted to come out to my father as a gay man. A lot of my hesitancy was rooted in my cultural traditions, in East Asian traditions like Japanese and Korean, they not only, and Chinese, they not only share a writing system, but they share a school of philosophy and thought known as Confucianism. And in Confucianism, one of the primary concerns is a concept called filial piety. It's a concept I myself didn't learn until doing research on Confucianism. Filial, from the Latin meaning related to the sun, the S-O-N, and piety meaning reverence for and respect for. So in a Confucian model of filial piety, we have the son or the daughter who is showing reverence for his or her father or mother. And the idea is that the filial piety is the relationship between the child and the parent that goes upward to respect parents, but also not only your immediate parents, but all of the ancestors who came before your father or your mother. So two po points of clarification around the concept of filial piety. Filial piety does not mean blind obedience to what your father or mother wants. Because after all, what your father or mother might want for you might not be the option that most rever reveres and respects their ancestors. So for example, if a mother asks her son to do a politically corrupt action, it's actually the son's duty through filial piety to disobey his mother and to not do the politically corrupt act in order to honor the ancestors who came before his mother. Another point of clarification is that although the arrows are going upward, the respect that a son or daughter shows to his or her father or mother is not only one directional. The parent also has a responsibility to respect their child. And I'm drawing this with a dotted uh, arrow here because at the end of the day, it's, what's at stake is their ancestor's reputation, right? So if a father disrespects his daughter, that shows unfavorably on his parent who raised him. And so everything is moving up, but there is a reciprocal relationship here in filial piety. In an Asian American context here in the US, this concept is not necessarily spoken about. And again, I didn't learn this concept until I did research on Confucianism. But I can say that this concept is embodied through our relationships. We are taught this through our relationships with each other. So I grew up knew, knowing that whenever I acted, I acted not only as an individual, but my actions also reflected on my father and mother and on the ancestors before them. So it's within this context that I was evaluating whether to share the letter with my father. And in this context, I realized that coming out to my father as gay might not be the option that most reveres my ancestors, because certainly coming out involves there would be a component of shame it would, be seem as, it would seem as if it were disrespectful. 
And so I made the choice not to share the letter with my father, to not come out to my father as gay. I went home and I did call my father and he was actually quite surprised that I was calling him. He said, why are you calling? I said, <laughs> I said, it's Father's Day. I'm calling to wish you Happy Father's Day. But why are you calling? Happy Father's Day. He didn't understand why I was calling. And at that time I thought, well, perhaps he's getting senile. He's getting older. That could be a component to it. But I was also thinking that might have been his indirect way of telling me, you've never called me on any Father's Day before this. Why are you calling me this Sunday? I don't remember anything else we talked about that Father's Day. But that ended up being one of my last conversations with my father. And so today's sermon is a postscript to my father. Our scripture reading today is a postscript of sorts. We are in 2 Corinthians, and we are at the last four verses of this text. Paul had a very close relationship with the people at Corinth. He actually formed this congregation. He spent 18 months with them. And over time, he wrote them a series of letters as he traveled away from Corinth, some of which have been lost. And so we know that what ended up being 2 Corinthians is actually there were at least three letters before that. So 2 Corinthians is really more like 4 Corinthians. Also, scholars have identified that 2 Corinthians is not one letter. It's actually made up of fragments of different letters that an editor sat down and wove the fragments together from Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. And so, in this, the editor, whoever put these pieces together, closes the letter as Paul's final words to this church in Corinth to whom, with whom he was so closely affiliated. And he offers some parting advice. And the words that we heard in our scripture contain four imperatives. The first is put things in order. Put things things in order. The verb in Greek means to put things in order, to restore things, to mend things, to make things complete, to be in right relationship with each other. But that verb in Greek is actually in the passive voice, so we have to flip it around. Be restored, be made whole, be made complete, be put in right relationship with each other. That's the first one. The second one, our English translation says, listen to my appeal. The verb there means to appeal, to exhort. Some, Paul is exhorting them to do something. He's friendly, friendly encouraging them to do something. So another translation is to encourage one another, to comfort one another. And again, this verb is in the passive voice. So be encouraged. Be comforted. That's the second one. The third one, and these get quicker as we go along, I promise. The third one out of the four says, um, listen to my appeal. Ah, agree with one another. And the verb here is for agree is the same is connected with a noun that means mind, spirit, will. So what Paul is saying is be of the same mind, be of the same spirit, be of the same will as each other. Live in unity with each other. And the fourth and final one is live in peace. And that's very straightforward. Another translation would be be at peace. Live in peace be at peace. So what Paul is saying is all of these things, be put in right relationship with each other, be comforted, live in unity with each other, live in peace. All of these things, Paul say, says, is possible through the grace of God. Through the grace of God, all these things are possible. And these are some of his last words to his beloved church in Corinth. The people at Corinth did not receive these words of wisdom from Paul until after he left them. 
And likewise, I did not receive certain words of wisdom from my father until after he died. Father's Day 2013. I had just finished preaching at Art and Soul. I had preached a narrative sermon. You all know sometimes I preach stories. And to be honest, it was probably the least effective story fable I've ever preached. <laughs> Some of you were there. <laughs> It was ineffective because it was Father's Day, and I had chosen a narrative format because I needed some emotional distance between myself and the idea, the concept of fathers and sons, because my father had passed away five months before that. And so ultimately, it was ineffective because I had created too much emotional distance between me and the sermon. When I got home, I opened my email and I discovered an email from my sister, which she had sent at 12.38 a.m. My sister, Tisha, who is two years older than I am. And here's an excerpt, a fragment of her email to me. Hi, Chatty. How are you doing? I'm writing this somewhat quickly as I've been debating whether to say anything at all, so here goes. One thing I learned from Dad's life is that relationships are harder when one keeps secrets. My word for important stuff in life. I learned from Dad's death that when someone passes, you can't keep secrets from them. I got a very strong message from Dad, and I think Nana and Papa, who are my mother's parents, and possibly Diane, who was my father's wife. It was hard to discern who was telling me, but definitely seemed like more than one while we were still in Hawaii. This was one week after my father had passed away. My sister and I returned for the funeral. Dad didn't want me to say anything at the time, but now I think I can. I think they wanted you to know that they know everything. They love you and accept you as you truly are. No secrets. They told me because I think they are concerned about you. I'm here for you if you need me. I love you too. I'm saying this now because I want you to know how much he cares about you. Dad could have told me any number of things, but his first message was about his concern for you and your well-being. I thought you should know this, especially on Father's Day. I think Dad's love for you is greater now than when he was living. I hope that helps. Love you. I was in tears. How foolish I had been. I thought I hadn't come out to my father because out of respect for my ancestors, but what I realized is I didn't come out to my father out of fear. I was afraid he wouldn't love me. I was afraid that our love for each other wasn't big enough, wasn't strong enough. I had underestimated my father's love for me. I was so short-sighted so naive, so young. I felt like a 10-year-old boy again. Father's Day, 2014. Dear Dad, I trust that these words will find their way to you. Perhaps wherever you are, you already know what is in my heart and what I'm about to say. Thank you for your love and affirmation. In the moment when I first read Tisha's email, I felt like I had been hit in the gut. The wind was taken out of me. I had been so foolish. Forgive me. Sometime after the divorce, I lost sight of your authority. When you didn't return my phone calls, I mistook your silence as apathy. When you didn't show up for weekend visits, I mistook your distance as an abandonment of your duties as father. And so, 
I abandoned my duties as son and did not offer you the reverence expected of me. I arrogantly thought I was a better person than you, that I knew better than you, and that I was wiser than you. In that moment, when I read the email and the wind was taken out of me, that wind was replaced by a new breath, a new spirit, a new understanding. All along, you knew I was different. All along, you knew I couldn't follow the norms of our tradition. Perhaps in offering me silence and offering me distance, you were giving me space to discover myself on my own terms away from the influence of your parents' expectations. You gave me freedom. Perhaps you did so unconsciously, but you took a risk that offering your son freedom might best honor your ancestors. All along, you were the wiser one. And in that moment, my understanding of our relationship was restored to its ideal. Father has authority over son. I had been struggling against our tradition for over 30 years, and I didn't need to struggle anymore. My understanding of our relationship was put in its proper order. I was finally, finally, in right relationship with myself and with you, and with our ancestors. And I felt a deep sense of peace, peace that I had never felt in my entire adult life. Now, when I preach Paul's words, be in right relationship with each other, be comforted, live together in unity, live in peace. When I preach these words, I do so with deeper conviction. Now, when I proclaim that through the grace of God, anything is possible, through the grace of God, that it is never too late for healing, through the grace of God, it is never too late for reconciliation, through the grace of God, it is never too late for transformation. When I proclaim these words, I do so because I have lived it myself. Thank you, Dad, for the gift of your wisdom and for all you have given me. I will always be your main man. Love, Chad. P.S. I don't know if your love for me now is greater than when you were living. I do know I feel your love now more than ever, and I feel my love for you now more than ever. And for that, I give thanks to the Holy Spirit that connects us, and I offer with great thanksgiving a deep amen. Amen. Amen.